It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yeah, they'll know we are Christians by our love. In times where everyone is so divided, how can we be a good neighbor? Feeling all of his mysteries and making everything as plain as day. And if I have faith to say to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give all I own to the poor, or even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gone nowhere. So, no matter what I say, no matter what I believe, no matter what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beautiful wood. Good morning. It is great to have you worshiping with us this morning here at Faith Bible Church. Excited to have you here. We are continuing in our series, obviously, on It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And this morning, I want to take you back to my senior year in high school. Uh, I had an opportunity to spend a year on a Rotary scholarship in Spain. And in that, uh, the uh, opportunity that we had, we would all come together. So essentially, students from Colorado, Wyoming, and western Nebraska on the scholarship program that were headed to Spain. We all met on a particular day in August and we left the then Stapleton International Airport, it's now Denver or DIA International Airport, on our way to head to Spain. And as a group we would travel together so we took off from Denver and then we landed in New York and then we took a flight from New York into Madrid where we would then spend the remainder of the year with our relative families. Interestingly enough, the group of us was about 25 to 30 students, and we had our kind of rotary youth jackets on. We all kind of looked similar to a degree, and we all flew in the similar part of the plane together. And I remember there was this one guy that I just looked at, and I was like, yeah, I don't like that guy. I hope that guy right there, when we get to Madrid, is as far away from where I'm going to live as possible, because, yeah, that guy, I just don't like him. 30-second judgment call, based off of really nothing other than my own thoughts and opinion. And interestingly enough, or ironically enough, or I would say providentially enough, guess what? As we all came together, as we all discovered where we were going, I came to realize and knew that I was headed to a town called Las Rosas, which was essentially a suburb of central Madrid. And that guy was going to live in Madrid, not 15 minutes away from me. And we were going to have to spend time together, monthly, talking about our experiences. That guy. Now, interestingly enough, that guy became my best friend in my time in Madrid. Adam Gartner, we spent time together, we traveled together, but what was interesting was I came to find that in a moment I just made a crack judgment on the outward appearance of a guy 
that for some reason, due to my internal clock, my internal thought process, just immediately looked past that individual and said, don't want anything to do with him. We don't do that, do we? We're not programmed to do that, are we? Let's be honest with one another. How often do we make crack judgments on someone about how they appear, maybe what they might look like, and maybe where they live, maybe what car they might drive or don't drive, maybe how they speak, and maybe how they're living? I want to ask us a question. How often do we just make a crack judgment on someone quickly and we don't take time to actually get to know that individual? Has anybody ever made a crack judgment on someone like I did with Adam Gardner and then come to find that if you actually engage that person, they're a beautiful individual even though they may not look like someone who fits your mold? This morning, we're going to take a moment. We're going to really think through what God might be calling us to do as we go out and try to love our neighbors. The question I want to ask and I want us to think about this morning is simply this. We only have to love our neighbors who agree with us and fit our mold. Right? Think through that for a minute. We all look around and we all look at our neighbors and if they fit our mold, if they fit sort of how we live and how we think and what we do, then sure, it's easy to go over and love that neighbor. But what if it's the Adam Gartner in your life? What if it's an individual who, after looking at them, just on a 15-second judgment, you say, yeah, I don't want to have anything to do with him or her. And I'm not just talking about the people that live next to you. I'm talking about maybe the individuals that you might work with or that you might come in contact with on a regular basis. We are so quick to judge. We are so quick to make assessment. We're so quick to either include off of external appearance or exclude and not take time to actually get to know that individual. This was one of the greatest lessons in life for me that I came to realize was that, you know what? I too, as great as I think I am, have some internal things that I need to work through, some internal aspects of me that are causing me to look at an individual and assess him or her for their value simply based upon outward appearance. What if Jesus did that? What if Jesus looked at our outward appearance and made a quick judgment on us whether he decided to include us in his club or not. This morning, as we continue to discuss and adventure in this series on loving our neighbor, I want us to turn to a story. It's essentially the woman at the well. Several of you probably know it quite well. I'm sure it's been taught in Bible story classes, particularly when you were a child. But I think it's an interesting story that demonstrates to us some theological principles, but also the fact that Jesus was willing to look beyond the external and engage the internal to draw people to himself because of the love that he had and has for all of humanity. If you have your Bibles with you, let's take a moment. We're in John chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 7. I'm going to go back and give a little context in a moment, but we engage and encounter Jesus going over to a woman at a well. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, 
the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you, Jews, claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And then we continue with the story. It's interesting. Because Jesus does something completely countercultural for his day. The first thing that I want you to see in this story, and it's particularly in that first verse, is for Jesus to engage a Samaritan woman was something that you simply did not do. This wasn't necessarily a crack judgment. This wasn't Jesus potentially looking at someone and saying, yeah, I don't like that individual. You just didn't do this. For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. And a rabbi, an esteemed rabbi of Jesus' stature, certainly didn't talk to a woman. You didn't do it. Yet Jesus breaks all barriers. Jesus breaks all cultural and religious barriers when he speaks to a woman from Samaria. Think through this for a minute. Because the world, the world in Jesus' day is essentially expecting Jesus to walk right by and not engage her at all. But Jesus wants to draw close to her. Now the other thing that we come to find out later in the story is this. There's a reason why Jesus wants to draw close to her. Because he wants to get to know her and offer living water. A couple of things that I want us to see as we walk through this story. First and foremost, Jesus breaks all cultural and religious barriers when he speaks to a woman from Samaria. One of the things that I want you to think about is this. Jesus breaks all cultural and religious barriers when he wants to come to you. That is so important for us to remember and recognize. There is no perfect mold or fit for a Christian. All are precious in the sight of God. All are created in the image of God. We need to remember and recognize that. And when an individual comes to either this church or into your world that doesn't fit your mold, lovingly what I ask is this, is it possible that God has placed this individual in your life to be living water to them? Now we are not God, please hear me, I'm not elevating us to the status of Jesus. But what's interesting here is Jesus turns to this woman and he doesn't have to do so. In fact, if anyone was observing, they would look and they would say, what in the world is that individual doing? You simply don't do that. 
Now, why is this true? Well, let me give you a little bit of history here. First and foremost, culturally, and ladies, please forgive me, this was just during Jesus' day, it was extremely rare, if not even prohibited, for a man to speak to a woman in a public place. The other thing is, is it was very rare, if not prohibited, for a rabbi or a teacher of religious culture to speak to a woman. But it was even more rare. In fact, you were even possibly hated for it if you were a Jew and you engaged an individual from Samaria. I mean, this is worse than me going over and hugging a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Okay? Like, you just don't do it. Right? Now, why is that so? Okay? People from Samaria were essentially with the Jewish people back in the day. They went into exile, they were in exile, and then they got out of exile. But some Jews decided to stay in the area where they were in exile. Those Jews then intermingled with that culture and became the Samaritans. The Jews went back to their land and lived in this area, and hence a different culture was created. They were seen by the Jews as impure, second-class citizens because they were not the holy people of God. You don't talk to them. You don't deal with them. In fact, those people, they left us for something different. And so for years, that sediment brewed. That sediment was there. Now, it's one thing to just talk to a Samaritan. But a Samaritan woman? Oh, and by the way, we know who she is. Now, we don't get her name, okay? And I'm not going to give a name. Do you know who she is? Do you know her history? I mean, she's on her sixth guy. She can't have any value at all. Why would you even associate with her? And yet, we see that Jesus breaks all cultural and religious barriers when he speaks to a woman from Samaria. Why is this? I think Tony Evans says this quite eloquently. He says this, God will meet you where you are in order to take you where he wants you to go. What does that mean, friends? It means that God is going to pursue anyone whom he chooses, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, and no matter how bad or worthless they may look to society. God pursued me. I'm sure I didn't fit somebody's mold. I'm sure that when people looked at me back in my day, they just saw a partying frat boy who wanted nothing but himself. And yet God pursued me. And God found me of worth. Friends, all people are of worth to God. And that is so important for us to recognize and realize. Jesus meets this woman where she is at in order to take her where God wants her to go. But he's first got to meet her where she's at. And what we're going to see in this story is that Jesus does confront areas of which she's living unrighteously in love and in correction. But notice the first thing that he does. He doesn't go up to her and say, hey lady, I know that you are on your sixth guy. And we're going to talk about that in just a little, little bit. What does he do? He goes to her and he meets her where she's at. She's at the well and she's drawing water. And so he says, hey, can I have a drink? Now interestingly enough, John is very particular about picking up natural things 
common things that people do to speak via how Jesus speaks to spiritual truths. So he goes over and he says, hey, can I have a drink of water from the well? And interestingly enough, she's kind of looking and she's going, well, first and foremost, why is this guy speaking to me? Second of all, he's a Jew. And third of all, she may or may not know that he's a rabbi, but she certainly know that he knows that he's in a position of esteem. Completely out of the blue. And then we continue on into verses 8 through 15, and this is what we begin to discover. Before confronting her sin, Jesus offers her the gift of the Holy Spirit or living water. Friends, I love this because we look at the fact that Jesus is going to be direct. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But before just going over and saying, you don't fit the mold, you're in sin, you're condemned. He offers her the gift of living water. He utilizes the well to offer living water, which is a reference to the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm here to offer you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He knows, it's obvious Jesus knows, that this lady has some issues. But he first comes up and says, I want to offer you the gift of living water. I want to offer you and anyone who comes to drink essentially from me. That's where he's driving. The gift of living water. Why is this important? Because so often, friends, after we come to Christ, we come to Christ in grace and in mercy, and then after we live a few years, we take away that grace and mercy, and we start to put stipulations toward it. Well, you can be a Christian if. You can be a Christian if you look this way. You can be a Christian if you talk this way. You can be a Christian if you vote this way. But you can't be a Christian if you don't do those things. And so we put these judgments on, and yet we forget that all who come to Christ through his mercy and grace and the love that is displayed on the cross are brothers and sisters in his name. And the offer is there. Can I ask another question? Anybody here perfect? Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus continues. We're in this story... And he says, essentially this, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She knew it too. Like you, you're, you're not supposed to be doing this. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given it to you living water if you really knew what's going on here. Sir, she's polite, right? You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? She still doesn't get it. She's thinking, okay, on a temporal level, right? They're talking surface level. It's the issue that's at hand, right? Give me a drink. Well, okay, first of all, you're not supposed to be talking to me. Second of all, that's fine, but you don't have anything to draw with. So she's still thinking temporally, surface level. And Jesus is there to actually go much deeper. And that's the other thing that I want to point to us too. How often do we just speak of surface things? Hey, how's the weather, right? Did you check the score of the game the other day? Hey, how'd your team do? And those are fine. But how many of us are willing to go a little bit deeper than just surface issues? Because lovingly, I can check the weather on my phone. <laughs> I can check the scores of the game on my phone. But what if we go a little bit deeper? Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Okay. Help me in that. How are you fine? What's going on in your life? How can I be thinking of you? How can I be praying for you? What can I do as a brother and sister in Christ to engage? That's with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but that also can be with a neighbor. Just a, a simple thing. Before you go and you point out the fact that they're different than you or that they're living in sin or that, that they don't fit the mold, 
Maybe what you do is, is you go to them and say, hey, I just want to offer you prayer. Can I just pray for you? And maybe they'll open up. Maybe they'll talk to you and say, you know what? Yeah, you can. You know, to be honest with you, I'm living with a guy, the sixth guy. I'm, I'm, I've had five husbands. I know it's not right. I know that maybe culturally it's not what looks good. But, but man, you should see the story. I feel so hurt and rejected right now. How could anybody love me? I've gone through five individuals and I'm on this sixth one. And I don't know, but I'm just there because maybe I need security. Maybe I do love this person. But the world looks at me and they look at me like I'm just trash and I'm not worthless. And I can't believe that you'd actually even come and talk to me and offer me anything at all. Jesus goes... And he begins to confront her. But before he does, he offers her the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is living water. And then interestingly enough, he does begin to discuss the issues that are there. Uh, We move in, and uh, I just want to kind of go to verse 13. It says, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. So he's saying, hey, I'm not talking about the water here. I'm talking about a deeper level. I'm talking about a deeper aspect. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's the kind of water that I want offered. That's the kind of water that needs to be given. The woman in verse 15 said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Engages. Let me offer this to you. Let me give this to you. And then he turns, and that's when he begins to confront her sin. In verses 16 through 26, Jesus confronts her sin, but he doesn't condemn her. Rather, he loves her through it. And I carefully chose that word, through it. Please hear me, brothers and sisters. I'm not here celebrating sin. I don't want anybody to think that when someone comes to Christ that we just allow anyone to continue in sin and remain in sin. No, we're called, obviously, to turn and change from it. We're called to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we see them in sin, we're called to lovingly engage them and say, hey, I see what you're doing here and it's harmful or hurtful. But how often do we just look and we sit high on our pedestal and just say, that person's a sinner, that person's a sinner, that person's a sinner, that person's a sinner, and look at how great and how holy I am because I bring my Bible and I come to church on Sunday and therefore I must be better than they are. Jesus loves her through it. I thought a lot about that word. Loves her through it. Friends, let me tell you that Jesus is loving you right now through your sin. Jesus is loving me right now through my sin. Because, friends, as much as I want to tell you, until we go to be with Christ in glory, we will continue in sin. And God continues to love us through it. I'm not celebrating sin. I'm not saying because of that, let's not go out and encourage people toward righteous living. But how often do we make judgments on individuals and cast them aside because of the visual aspect that we see in our life for a temporary moment? I've said it before, and I want to just kind of do something with you. We're going to do just a little experiment. We're not going to put it up on the wall, but several of us are uh, mathematicians, correct? We understand graphs. Okay, do we get how graphs work? Well, we're going to have our, you know, our x and our y axis, right? We're going to have our y axis here, and we're going to have our x axis here. And this is essentially time. So this is just, you know, from here to the, to the future. And the, the y axis is essentially... Uh, aspirational holiness. Does that make sense? So, if we're down here, you're not doing so well, right? You're, you're, you're more sinning, for lack of a better word. You're up at the top, right? 
you're, you're holier than Jesus, and that's theologically incorrect, but I'm just kind of giving you an example, right? And somewhere in our lives, right, we will, Lord willing, be met by Jesus. And when we do, we receive the gift from God offered to us, which is the gift of living water, the Holy Spirit, the well that will spring within us. But let me ask you this. Does anybody just, you know, go perfectly in a line like that? Does anybody just go perfectly like that? Doesn't the line kind of go like this? Right? So here's where I'm going with this. A few things. Number one, don't judge somebody because they're on a downward curve. You may not know. You may not know what's going on in their life. No, I'm not saying celebrate their sin. I'm not saying don't confront them lovingly in it. But we're so quick just to look at somebody in a, in a, in a time, time segment of one aspect of their life and we don't see essentially what God is doing entirely through it. And the other thing that I'll tell you is this. Praise God that he essentially grades or looks at the average. Because I'll tell you that my graph, I guarantee you, I pray, is going in this upward direction. But there are days when, yep, I'm doing much better, and there are days when I'm doing much worse. And praise God that he doesn't judge me on a singular shot, a one-shot experience of my life, but rather he loves me through my sin. John continues on with Jesus, and he says this. He says, go and call your husband and come back. Bring him too. Right? I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. He, he knows this. He knew it all along. And he easily could have, A, just said, number one, that woman's from Samaria, and B, she's a woman, and pfft, Man, look at, she's really not doing well. I just, she's just beyond hope. <laughs> but he goes and he offers her the living water. And then he begins to engage in the deeper aspect that has been troubling her. Probably the one that she feels the most shame and guilt about. In fact, it is the reason that she feels guilt and shame. Because, friends, if we go to the verse right before this story, we come to find out that she's drawing water from the well in the sixth hour. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us, but in Jesus' day, that means that she's drawing water from the well at noon. Now, that might not mean anything to us around here in Iowa because it's right now kind of cool at noon. But in Samaria, for a woman to draw water from the well at noon, at the height of the heat of the day, you just don't do it. The ladies would go in a group. They would go together early in the morning, and they would either go and get the water for the day that they needed, or some of them would go later in the evening together. And ladies, I love you, but I know you. It's the water cooler talk. Now, I'll stop there because we're not much better. But this was when you found out what was going on in the town at the water cooler. Yes, you did your chore for the day. Yes, you did what you needed to do. But this is when everybody talked. This was when everybody figured out what was happening and the town gossip occurred. And I guarantee you, this woman was the subject of town gossip. She's on her sixth man. Man, she just has to be awful. Can you believe it? They're not even married. She's beyond hope. Sure, it's easy to talk about her, but can you imagine? Has any ever been sort of the subject of gossip? Has any ever been incorrectly judged? Now, 
I'm not saying that what she was doing was great. I'm not celebrating the fact that she was essentially with a man and they were not married. But we don't know her circumstance. And interestingly enough, we look at it and we recognize that Jesus is confronting this, but we also don't know the reasons why. Maybe one or two or three of her husbands passed away. Maybe they left her. But I don't know about you. If I'm somebody and I'm on my sixth person, don't you begin to think, man, maybe there's something wrong with me? Maybe I'm the one that doesn't have value. Maybe there's no hope at all. Maybe I'm beyond hope. Maybe I'm beyond what is there. I wonder how many people, I wonder how many people right now are in our town, just two minutes away from us, who are thinking the same thing. I'm just not good enough. Life's been too hard on me. I just have too many problems. I'm just not the mold of church. If people really knew who I am and what I'm going through, they wouldn't want me there. Because I don't fit the religious and cultural mold of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And you know what Jesus does? <laughs> he walks right up and says, Hey, can I have a drink from your well? And I want to offer you living water. I want to offer you the gift of the Holy Spirit. I know, I, I know what's going on in your life. I know what you're dealing with. I know what you're struggling with. I know the sins that you have, but I want to offer this to you. And I want to love you through your struggle. Now, I'm not going to let you hide from it. Please hear me. Okay, friends, I don't want us to think that Jesus is sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to ignore sin. No, Jesus died on a cross to remove us from sin. But what does he also say? Go and sin no more. We're to move toward holiness. We're to move toward righteousness. But the reason that we do is not works-based. It's grace-based. It's the fact that Jesus came first and offers before he says, hey, before I give you this living water, you need to clean yourself up. You've got to figure this out. You better figure out what's going on with this guy. And by the way, you're kind of on the cusp of not being worthy of drinking from my living water well. Never says that. Never says that. Friends, let me tell you this. I think this might hit home. Jesus confronts her sin but does not condemn her. Rather, he loves her through it. So let me tell you this. Don't judge someone because they sin differently than you. We're so quick to cast judgment. We're so quick to look and say, well, they're in the wrong. They're in sin. But don't judge someone simply because they sin differently than you. Again, I want to be very careful here. I'm not saying that we celebrate sin. I'm not saying that we don't call individuals toward a life that is in its trajectory toward Jesus. But may we also not sit on a pedestal and just kind of look down on people because we feel that we've arrived and that they are less holy than we are because they don't fit our Christian mold. He loves her through it. And friends, let me tell you this. Jesus right now is loving us through it. He is loving us through our sin in spite of our sin. He's paid the price on the cross so that we can be removed of the penalty and the guilt of our sin. But we continue to do so. Paul even struggles with this. He says, why do I keep doing what I don't want to do? I don't understand. And what we come to recognize, it's the aspect so that the grace of God might increase. Oh, the mighty grace of God. 
Now let's not pervert that grace. Let's not distort that grace. Let's recognize the cost that it took to receive that grace. But I don't know about you, but I praise God for the grace that he gives each and every day. And I praise him that it's not three strikes and you're out because I would have been out a long, long time ago. And so we continue on. And we see in verses 27 through 30 in this story, before you judge, before you judge, stop and think about all your sin that God has forgiven. I think it would be so much more interesting if we as a church would recognize the sin that God has forgiven in our lives when we look out across and we see someone who doesn't fit the mold of what we think it is to be a follower of Jesus. Because the last that I checked, in order to be a follower of Jesus, it's to drink from the living water that's presented by God through grace and faith in Jesus Christ. It's to believe in the one who says, I have the power to save. If Jesus has the power to save you, then why doesn't he have the power to save that person who doesn't fit the mold? Because I'll tell you, I didn't fit the mold. And Jesus saved me. And I didn't do it. It was because of his love, his mercy, and his grace that I stand before you this morning. Before you judge, stop and think about all your sin that God has forgiven. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. When we judge, when we cast judgment on someone and say they are beyond hope, recognize what are we doing? We're robbing them of grace. Now, God will pursue them. God is bigger than us. But essentially what we're doing is, is we're saying, well, God's grace is good enough for me. But it's certainly not good enough for you. Wow. I'm sure people said that about me. <laughs> and Mrs. Yader, I ask for your forgiveness. I wonder if she said that about me. Mrs. Jider was my seventh grade English teacher. And I wasn't too hip on English. And so I made it my duty to try to distract Mrs. Jider as much as possible by playing renditions to eruption during the time that she was teaching. So Mrs. Jider, in her infinite wisdom as a teacher, put me in the back of the classroom, which as she should have. And for whatever reason, I discovered where Mrs. Jider lived. And one night I decided that Mrs. Jider was going to receive a wonderful basket of raw eggs at her front doorstep by me on her door. Mrs. Jider never caught me, probably until now. But what I came to discover was Mrs. Jider was a believer in Christ. And she disciplined me as she should have, but I also came to discover that she was praying for me. She loved me through my sin. Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. We see at the end of this story, essentially, the disciples rejoin. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Okay, so there's this iteration that, okay, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on here? But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? I think that's important to see because they get what's going on. They say, hey, Jesus is up to something here. I don't get it. I don't necessarily understand it. It's culturally different than what we're used to. But for whatever reason, he has chosen to engage her. 
And then I love this. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the, ta- their, their, uh, the town and made their way toward him. What a beautiful story. She begins to recognize that I don't have any hope. Nobody engages me. I'm kind of the, the, the gossip of the town. And here's this person who has offered me living water and told me to go. And what does she do? She completely forgets about the task at hand and she's so elated. She goes back into the town and tells people and says, come and see who this individual is. Could he be the Messiah? Friends, what if we did as Jesus did? What if we went to those individuals who are women at the well in Panora, Iowa? Those outsiders, those people who don't fit the mold, and we went to them and we said, hey, we love you and we want to offer you living water. We want to offer you our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to give you the gift of God. We want to encourage you in who it is. And then by offering that, by loving them where they're at, allowing God to work in their lives, to perhaps down the road see what might be the area that they're sinning in and struggling with, and then loving them through that as well. Because friends, all of us are struggling with sin. All of us have areas in our lives that we need to draw closer to God with. But if we offer and we love, what a beautiful story that will be. The other thing too, I want to just briefly go over 1 Peter 4, and there's just a little spot in here that I want to encourage us in. So if we recognize what Jesus is doing, and we go to individuals, how do we continue to keep moving forward? And that's what I want to encourage us in with this passage. And it's simply this, that if we keep loving one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Now, please hear me again. I do not want us to thinking that all we need to do is love and that we don't talk about sin or that we remove discussion of sin. That's not what I'm saying here. This is not come as you are, stay as you are. This is come as you are and be loved by God. But in being loved by God because of his love for you, prayerfully and hopefully displayed by us who love God too, we together move away from a life that desires sinful actions and move toward a life that is more holy. And that's just simply separated for God. But can I tell us something? None of us are perfect. So we're all in the same boat. And we are all moving in direction prayerfully toward a life that is more holy because of the love of God. Not because we're better than other people. 1 Peter 4, essentially 7, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Oftentimes, when we go and we love individuals, it will move toward covering the sin. What do we mean by this? Okay, it doesn't mean that we just overlook it. It doesn't mean that we don't confront it. But what it means as we cover over it, we forgive, we love individuals through it, and people come and they say, you know what, I can't believe that they still loved me in spite of that sin. And it's the love that draws and covers to where that individual over time says, you know, I was struggling in this area. I had this issue in my life where the world would have rejected me, where, the, where, where people would have just for, forgotten me. They would have cast me aside. But Jesus and his church loved me through it. And as they did, now I don't want that anymore. I want the love of God more in my life. Continues on and it just says, 
offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's judgment. No, God's grace. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do so as one speaking the very word of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with all the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. It's interesting. Uh, I want to just talk about this. This comes from Bible reference. The idea that our love for each other covers a multitude of sins reveals our imperfection. Christians are not yet sinless. We are not perfect. Love for each other includes forgiving each other, overlooking past hurts, building each other up when we fall. Not if we fall. Not for some of us who fall, but others don't because we're perfect. When we fall. Friends, one of the things I want to encourage you in is this. Is there are individuals out there who do not fit the Christian mold, but what is the Christian mold? And if we think that there are individuals out there that don't fit the Christian mold, lovingly I tell us, then why do we even think there is a mold to Christianity? Because the only mold that I'm aware of to Christianity is, is that all are saved by grace through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all who should come to him shall not perish, but how, what? Shall have eternal life. There's no condition. There's no aspect. There's no but this. Come, drink from my well. We only have to love our neighbors who agree and fit our mold, right? Take home truth today that I want to encourage us in as we think about going out and loving our neighbors is this, is may we love our neighbors where they are at. Where they are at. After all, we too are sinners forgiven by the love of God. Here's what I want to tell you. Uh, may I go and love somebody where they're at. But also, I pray that people will love me where I'm at. Because I'm not perfect. I too have moments where I fall. And the joy of being in Christ is to be loved where you're at. Now please, if I'm in sin and there's areas that I need to work on, I want to be told about that. But I don't want to just be cast aside because Jesus loves us through our sin. He doesn't cast us aside because of it. Let's take a moment and go to our Lord and Savior in prayer. Father, this morning we've seen this challenging yet beautiful story of the woman at the well in Samaria. And we've also seen the words out of 1 Peter 4. Father, it's something that is such a, just an interesting aspect of how Christ interacts. Lord, when the world would just essentially throw out and throw away, when the world would say, that individual you just simply don't go and talk to, when the world would say, you're not supposed to do that, when the world would say, you're not supposed to associate with that person, when the world would say, that person is beyond hope, when the world would say, she is worthless. God would say, that's the one sheep I want to go after. Father, I pray that if there's an individual out there that comes to our minds, if there's an individual that you've placed in our life, that we would go and we would love them where they're at. Father, it doesn't mean that we just throw away the need to repent and turn away from our sins. But Father, how can we repent and turn away from our sins through a judgment? We repent and turn away from our sins through receiving the love, the mercy, and grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And after having received, saying, I can't believe that I'm loved by God in spite of what I do, 
begin to say, I don't want to do it anymore because God loves me. And we allow God to work in the heart of the individual to turn and encourage them away from what it is that might be drawing away from his presence. But Father, may we allow God to work through us to offer that living cup, that living water, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And may we not go to them and say, well, you can have this if, or you can have this when, but before you get your life together, it can't be offered. Let's offer it. Let's give it. Let's plant and water, as Paul says, and then let's allow God to grow the fruit of his ministry. Lord, may we love our neighbors where they are at, and may we remember, after all, we too are sinners forgiven by the love of God. We thank you. We praise you. We ask these things in your name, dear Jesus, and we ask them by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, our living water. And all God's people say, Amen.